introduco brevemente Hans van der Meer. Um, so, mi ripeto ancora una volta, ma eh, siamo particolarmente contenti di, di avere con noi Hans van der Meer. Hans van der Meer è tra i più eh, noti e importanti fotografi, fotografi olandesi. Uh, dopo aver vinto um, credo abbastanza giovane un, un, un premio del uh, Wordpress Photo il, uh, um, ha realizzato i progetti che probabilmente gli hanno dato uh, anzi senza probabilmente gli hanno dato notorietà che è un lungo lavoro sostanzialmente durato alcuni anni uh, sui campi da calcio um, amatoriali in particolare sui, sugli incontri di calcio eh, amatoriali da prima sull'Olanda eh, mi riferisco a Dutch Fields e in seguito sul resto d'Europa questo secondo progetto si chiama European Fields e, che per l'appunto insomma gli hanno dato notorietà eh, internazionale eh, insegna anche all'Accademia Reale d'Arte dell'AIA e il suo ultimo libro è questo The Netherlands of the Shelf, che è un, un lavoro sulle città minori eh, olandesi, che Hans ci sta, <ride> ci sta mostrando. Ehm, come eh, sicuramente avrete letto, eh, Hans van der Meer terrà un uh, workshop eh, domani che per mere ragioni organizzative... Ehm, è a numero chiuso, uh, tuttavia insomma, abbiamo deciso di uh, organizzare per questo pomeriggio un seminario al, insomma, aperto a tutti, nel quale uh, Hans van der Meer ci parlerà del suo, uh, del suo, del suo lavoro e del, diciamo, delle motivazioni insomma, che uh, sono state dietro i suoi progetti. Uh, una piccola, come già ho avuto modo di dire l'altro ieri, uh, siccome c'è stato un problema per il quale non abbiamo un servizio di traduzione, in questo caso non chiederò a, <ride> non chiederò a, a Mara insomma, di tradurre, ma dato anche che il tempo che abbiamo non è tantissimo, io proverei a, uh, semplicemente a non tradurre, anche perché Hans, insomma, non essendo un madrelingua, a un inglese più, credo, insomma, più facilmente comprensibile, però se ci dovessero essere dei problemi su alcuni punti, insomma, se non dovessero essere chiari alcuni passaggi, possiamo, eh, insomma, possiamo tradurre, possiamo eh, in maniera molto libera, insomma, anche interromperlo. Eh, grazie Hans, thank you Hans for coming here. Eh, It's a parola. pleasure. Ah, no, no, ok, you have got the microphone. Yeah, I have it, yeah. Okay. Ah. Anyway, um, I do a short introduction about where I come from, briefly, because it's connected to one of my projects. But throughout the talk, I will talk about the projects I did in the past, not, in, not always in a chronological way, though I do end with my latest project. And after that, I do a little bit about useful photography, which is a magazine I founded together with a few other friends. And, um, but basically, photography as literature, film, and a lot of art is, is for me a world of ideas. And how I pick up the ideas throughout the years is what I will tell you. This is a picture of the village where I grew up. And this was an assignment by the Dutch Architecture Institute in 1993 when they were founded. And in collaboration with the Dutch Photo Museum, they gave five photographers a commission to define architecture photography in a different way. So not pictures from buildings, but differently. Basically, they asked us to reconstruct what the, the built environment and building in our childhood 
how it was represented, what kind of role did it play. And I grew up in a, a small town in between Leiden and Amsterdam. And I went back in 1993 to the places where I grew up and I photographed kids from around 8, 10 years old. And you always see them somewhere in the corner of your eyes and they are, especially on Wednesdays and in the weekend, they are doing some fake things in the landscape with a piece of wood and it's a kind of age when you grow up in the countryside it's kind of okay your mother doesn't know where you are when you come from school you are somewhere in the village you're kind of uh, exploring the area where you grow up and what I remember from my childhood is that it was partly a boring childhood of course this is a typical the backside of a typical Dutch new town from the 60s so in the Netherlands everybody recognizes these kind of situations and but what I do is when I get an assignment like that is that I try to put the, the main uh, subject behind another subject so the reason why I come up with the idea of photographing kids is just that I have the idea that for me photography is always such a pointy medium and I always tend to move a little bit away of the idea is that the picture and the photographer is framing something and you have to look at it and it makes it also, in a way it makes it also pointy. So look at this. So I always have the, had the idea when I started to do photography and we will later on you will see how I started my first big project in, in the 80s in Hungary but basically I always have the idea that I need to move away from the very direct way of looking at photography and pictures in that sense uh, so the childhood was like that and the idea of course is when I do a proposal to the to the, to the people that pay me I say look the subject will be there but it will be there in a more coincidental way rather than be the main thing in the foreground now, let's see if it works now yeah Thank you very much. So the next moment, it would be very exciting in my childhood. You know, we would we would go to these kind of places, and uh, but so so I gave in a series of photographs. I gave also the idea of what architecture. It was just something we would demolish, or we would climb, or we would be bored, and it is just there. And one of the frustrating things with photography is also that if you want, for instance, to show your admiration for the beauty of anything it's done so many times before so so it's the same reason when when you want to make pictures of things you kind of run into situations and think well this is not a good solution because it's, it's it's so much like a cliche though it is a beautiful situation you know like a sunset or a landscape or whatever so and i picked up the idea of doing that um somewhere in the 80s, I'll tell you a little bit later that, but when I was running into the football subject, that was somewhere in 1995, although I did already publish a book in 1988, and I already was photographing football somewhere in the early 80s, but I didn't find a way at that time to deal with it. Well, when I started to do it, it should be for me also clear that it was about body language, because body language is something in my work and how I started photography played a very important role um, and later on it was more like really the background and the foreground is like the theater you have the act and you have the stage this is from the Dutch fields the series I started in 1995 and the funny thing is with football that it's, it's a game it's a play it has a very theatrical element if you would see this on the street you would dial 112. And the funny thing is with these kind of situations that it refers to drama, but it isn't drama, it's, it's acting drama. Especially men, especially men like me. I'm one of these guys. Uh, and if you, if you wonder how they come, they look. So, I made a, this is also interesting, <laughs> look, this is us, and if this is, a, this is from starting filming in somewhere in the, around 2000, 
And this is when you see a guy doing this, as a photographer you kind of realize, it's not a picture, you know, it's a film. <laughs> For me it was always obvious that when I started to do film together, there's another reason why I started to do film, because basically I'm always on the ladder and my landscape is a framed situation and I didn't, I bring home from what I see, I thought I could bring home much more if I start to film. Anyway, these are a few guys from Portugal. Now they know how to act. <coughs> and, and there's a guy coming, now look, you can hear him shouting for his mother. But look at the other people, you see? Is that, is that dramatic? No. So what, what are we looking at? Theater. In French you have a beautiful word when things like this, they, they say cinema, theater. And exactly that is what is so interesting about this sport. This is a guy like me, he should stop. <laughs> but then you kind of see the child in this guy, look, when the, because the ball is coming near again and then he really wants to go on. He's a veteran, of course, but... <laughs> now, so this, is, this is really what we are, not? This is... And, and it is really funny that we don't realize it when we do it, but I, I did a project in the Netherlands. It was a kind, I, was, I was commissioned to do an art project, and I enlarged from from this series what I made in Europe, I just cropped out these kind of guys and I, I brought them back on the pitch, look. <laughs> you see? It's just a statement about, listen guys, this is, <laughs> this is a game, you know, this is a play. <laughs> Don't take it seriously. But anyway, so now we go back to, to my first big project. It, it's, it's around 1984. We have had huge demonstrations in Europe, anti-missile demonstrations in the 82, 83. And I wanted to do a project in Hungary. So I rang up the Ministry of Culture. It, w it was communistic. Uh, the Iron Curtain was there. I said, I want to do a project there. Okay, they say, just fill in this paper, some questions. They had a kind of bilateral agreement with the Hungarians. I was lucky. They said to me, if you fill in the paper, you can go there. I filled in the paper, I almost forgot it. Three months later, telephone, your ticket is ready, sir, you can go. And I was, for two weeks, I was the guest of the Ministry of Culture. I was taken around and they took me to the ministry and said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I would like to get in touch with the Hungarian photography scene. And also I would like to prepare a longer stay, two things. They took me around for two weeks and it was fantastic and I met a lot of people and I went back in September and I rented an apartment and I started to walk the streets. And the series of photographs, I was basically interested in, in around that time in taking pictures of what I would call a kind of coincidental thing. I compare it sometimes with um, it's in photography, it's the kind of thing that you can, you can mystify a very clear situation or you can look at something and you still don't know what it is connected to. And my, I always tend to move away to these kind of directions for the same reason as what I told before, that photography should, it can start floating from reality and move away from it into another direction if you don't try to connect it to so many things, but you try to disconnect it in a way to where it comes from. And as it is literally uh, out of a sequence, and it has a kind of this causal reality or relationship, you can kind of connect it, but you can also disconnect it. And I always liked to play with that side of photography. And, but when I was walking the streets, um, and I would go back to the Netherlands every now and then. 
and I would uh, make prints. And I, I remember one day I showed a pile of these photographs to a friend of mine, and he was studying these photographs, and he said to me, on every picture something is broken. And that really made me think. Because I thought I was dealing with some different thing. I thought I was dealing with body language. I was, I was dealing with another thing. And I need to make one other remark about it. Because in Amsterdam, we do a lot on, on the bike and we walk. And we have a lot of times you have this situation that somebody's passing you by and you hear just one sentence of a conversation. It's, it's, it goes like, you know, oh, fucking asshole it was last night. But you don't know anything. It's just one sentence. This is what I like about imagery also. You can take one thing out of its context and you can let it float in a different direction. But what happened obviously in Hungary is that the things around the people, they were also telling a story. I wasn't so much aware of it. I wasn't, at least it wasn't my subject. But by the remark of my friend, I started to think about it. And I thought, well, this is an interesting remark because Actually, it wasn't what I was pointing at. It is still in the picture. And finally, I finished the series. It won a prize in World Press Photo. And of, of course, there was a lot to say about it. Because Hungary at that time, we talk about 1985. It was not such a smooth functioning society at that time. A lot of things were not available. And the people were very stressed about the situation. And Obviously, it was all about Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt had divided Europe into two pieces, and they were on the other side, and they would always remind you of these kind of things. Uh, and you would see a lot of things, of course, in the street that were related to this huge history of the country. But for me, it was also, it was, it was, I was studying at that time. It was a study of all these quirky moments, which would be, I would run into situations like this, and it made me really start thinking about, it's not funny, you know, these people were left alone by the government, and the government wouldn't pay them a pension, so they had to collect carton. So you would see in the streets, you would see situations, sorry, I thought I had a few more, They're probably at the bottom of my, anyway, it doesn't matter, there, there, there were many of those situations, and they were, they, of course, they were related to another story. And, but basically, the, 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 the idea of having a subject and photographing another subject in the background, that became kind of part of my, my later work. Um, so this is the cover of the book. Um, I, I'm talking with Gerhard Steiler already for couple of years about a reprint from the archive which will be a different selection selection it will be uh, it will be interesting to see it because it's, it's a different part from what I've been showing at that time my, my second project what I, I uh, when I finished the, the, the Hungary project I moved back to the Netherlands and I started um, to work in, with, a, with a different camera a six by six on a series of photographs about production factories, plants. I grew up in a situation like that. My father had a biscuit factory and I worked there quite a lot of times. And I was very interested in this whole idea of uh, what a human being, but also basically the, the, the visual pleasure of all these situations, of all the mysterious things around these people. But it was also in a time when the Labour Party, not only in the Netherlands, especially also in the Netherlands. The Labour Party would ha have a kind of identity crisis, which they still are in. Because Labour had changed so much. Labour wasn't like a physical, a physical achievement, and, and it wasn't like photographing the power of human being. It wasn't also so much about people sitting next to automated uh, systems. I wanted to focus on one gesture, one thing, in the same way, but basically all these all these situations, they have they are automated, but there's always one or two weak points, and somebody has to sit there, um, has to take the rotten apples out or whatever. But this is this is 
this is the transition you were in at that time. More and more people are just sitting there and they, whenever, whenever something goes wrong, they will have to act. Later on, like five years later, when I started to film, I went back and you see, you see that I film more or less the same thing. This is a, a small summary of a, of a longer film. This is in a brick factory, obviously. Uh, this is the moment when something goes wrong and then they have to act. As so much what I remember from working in these places is everything goes quite well but then an alarm goes and then suddenly you have to come into action. But it's it's a very different way of defining work as what the, the photography used to emphasize. They used to emphasize or the situation from the point of view or of um, the social um, point of view from the workers or they used even before that they used to emphasize the power of mankind wasn't wasn't the situation at all you see the next it's a very short piece of film it's, it's, it's in a cheese factory and um, well you see a situation here where it almost works perfectly but not total perfectly so what he needs to do is he needs to push the cheese to help them a little bit around the corner. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what is so illustrative for these kind of places. And uh, the picture, uh, this is a picture I made seven years before and I came six, seven years later and I could film the same situation. But anyway, you see in my, in my book you see you see a lot of pressing on buttons, you see a lot of remote controls. So it's not like physical power anymore. So it's, it wasn't so surprising that the Labour Party lost contact with his, his background because Labour had changed so much. And this is the last photograph in the book which totally emphasizes the idea of one person controlling the whole plant. I think it's quite childish to do it like that, but it's a big factory. Um, and that then after this project I started a project in Amsterdam about the traffic and it was the first time I used a panorama camera but one of the reasons I used this 617 panorama camera is that it's really if, if you what I needed is a kind of angle that made it possible for me to photograph these situations but also I needed to have the, the backdrop of the city in a kind of the size that it's normally is appearing in your life. Now we all know if we use a wide angle like a 24 millimeter, the foreground will be very big but the backdrop will be very small. I, I, I got away with it by using a 617. It takes just a stroke out of a 13, 18 uh, size, uh, film size and 
Actually, you see me kind of continuing what I was doing in, in Hungary, but I, I got a little bit frustrated because it's, it's such a large uh, format and I was, I, was, I was very unsatisfied in the end by uh, having one thing in the middle and I preferred, I mean, there's a lot of things in Amsterdam going on between people. It's, it's a funny subject, but uh, I would prefer more to use the whole site a side effect of it is that you, you build up an archive from the, the place where you live and this is, uh, uh, this is the same situation but then six years later and actually it's, it's the, the environment where I live and there is a famous Dutch writer, Karel van der Dreven, and he, he wrote in a newspaper, he would write every day a column and just before he had to retire, just before he took off, uh, he said he was like 75 and he kind of realized suddenly walking through the city, he kind of realized, okay, this is how Amsterdam looks after my death. And this is so much photography, you know, this is so much we don't realize that we are passing by, especially in old towns. And the city is much older than we are. And I, I kind of like this, this idea of um, um, looking at it in that way. And photography is so good in these dry recordings. If you try to explain, it's, it's so obvious that when you see a photograph from yourself sitting in the garden and you are three years old or five years old, it's not the fact that you are sitting there. But suddenly you realize, oh, the little chair over there disappeared out of your life. It's the objects that make you much more realize that time times have changed and they are gone, they are, they moved away out of your life. And photography is so good in these kind of dry recordings of periods of time, we, we don't realize it in contemporary history writing, but you, this is, uh, some, some, some of the things you learn by using your archive is that ooh, suddenly the whole city has changed. And this is, this is an example of this. And these are, this is a picture from <coughs> the same street. It's in a Jewish area. It comes from the local, from the municipal archive in the Netherlands. And this is the, the, exactly the, the area where the Jews were all moved away in the war. And all these people, they, had, they didn't have a clue what was waiting them in, in about 25 years. It's another element of photography that, um, and these, these are my children because they grew up in the same area. It's the same tower, the same church. And I, uh, th these kinds of things I like to play with also. Anyway, this is, this is a, 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 an, an assignment from the city. It was, the city was a, a protected monument and they had the same theory. We have a problem. We are fed up with photographs of buildings. They are beautiful pictures, but we cannot, we cannot, um, we cannot use them any longer. I say, well, okay, I tried to do a project and uh, a building like that there on the right, which is the uh, beautiful museum, I just put it somewhere in the backdrop and I put the contemporary life in the foreground and this is the way I say, look, it's, it comes so much closer to how you, re, how you experience everything in your own life. So what you see me doing here also and also in other projects is playing with foreground and background and what is the subject and what isn't. Same situation with this. These uh, canal houses, they are famous, but taking a photograph of them would immediately lead to kind of, we call it art unlimited photography. It's a kind of aesthetic kind of thing, has been photographed. Thousands of people do it before you. Uh, you, you. You buy these postcards and you send it to people and say greetings from Amsterdam. Very aesthetic, very beautiful. They have nothing to do with the city I live in because the city I live in do doesn't look like that. Because, and, and one of the reasons is that these things are there, but they are not in the foreground of my life, they are in the backdrop of my life. So they, they play a different role. And I try to get away with it by, by showing them in a different way. Uh, now we, we, we jump a little bit back. This is about archival things and the influence of archival photography on my work. This is a, uh, a book I published in 1988 and I was phoned, somebody phoned me up and he said, you have to come and look. I have a beautiful pile of photographs of football. And then I went there 
and I saw a beautiful collection. And what struck me there was the space in football photography. Um, I, we made a selection and one of the reasons that the photographers wouldn't sit only behind the goal but also on the stand was that the people hadn't seen, in, this is a little bit from until the late 50s, the people hadn't seen the situations uh, on television. So the information would come only a few days later in the cinema, but the photography in the pictures, they would use pictures like this with arrows to show how the ball went in. So it, has a very, it had a very journalistic approach. And um, I always thought the newspapers in the Netherlands, until recently, they would make these kind of silly graphics to, to, to do kind of the same thing. Well, I think that, you know, you can, you can make a picture of it. This is a picture I took uh, from a game Juventus, Ajax Juventus in Amsterdam, 1988. Ajax was beaten by Juventus. And you can clearly see that something desperately went wrong in the defense of Ajax. You don't need any graphic of that, you just can photograph it. It's quite easy to do, you only have to have a different point of view. Now what happened historically is that when television came in, somewhere in, in the early 60s, it was the same time that the lens, lenses became longer and the films became faster and it would be also evening games. So what we discovered in the archive is that the photography of football went to a kind of radical change at the end of the 50s, the early 60s. Suddenly also the context totally disappeared, the historical context. You wouldn't see, you wouldn't see the people on the stands, you wouldn't see the flags on the stand, you wouldn't see even the things outside um, the stadium. And until now we are looking at these kind of boring photographs of football. If you, if you consider a photo as a, as a kind of collection of factual information, the only factual information you can get out of these kind of photography is that these three people were participating in that game. Otherwise, you don't have a clue what's going on. Um, in 1995, uh, apart from the Dutch fields, I also went onto the roof of the old Ajax Stadium. And this is a photograph that I always try to, I use it always to explain why foot, football became such a, an interesting television sport. It's totally understandable because what is so interesting about football is that we watch at the guy in ball possession, but does he see the options and the possibility what we see? It's quite fundamental. If you, if you think about football, it's quite fundamental. It's one eye in the ball and the other eye is for the overview. Now everybody in the stadium, also on the field, also the players, the next move can only be something that he has to be aware of. But is he aware of the fact that the space there, and is, does he see it? Now football is basically based, the success of football on television is basically based on a game of football, a 90 minute game of football is full of these kind of expectations, expectations running over each other because the next move, it's like in a game of chess, they all show you 10 moves before the end because the really dramatical move is always happening there. So the next move is, is, is well, you can choose for a couple of options. This is basically why people enjoy football so much. And you can photograph it, you can photograph these kind of tense moments just by climbing on a, on a, on a kind of stand or roof or whatever and, and make pictures of it. I did it for a while, but I'm not a sports photographer and I don't want to be a sports photographer. So I started to do the amateur football thing. It gives me a lot more pleasure. I kind of want to stay away from professional football. It's not my cup of tea, although I like to watch it every now and then. But um, it has these kind of things that, as a photographer, it, it doesn't give me any satisfaction. I went back to the, to the countryside, and this is the, the Dutch Fields book. Uh, you see me on the ladder, and there are a lot of these kind of... I was looking for, for, for literally a possibility to, sh to show that football is part of the culture. What do you have to do as a photographer to show that? You need the context, you need the landscape, you need the backdrop to say, to, to show where it is part of. Now, <coughs> that's, that was, in the end, that wasn't so easy. 
In the Dutch fields, you, you see me playing with a lot of items and issues that I remember from myself playing there on these places. Like in the, in the Netherlands, you have a lot of water and the ball was always used to, to go in there and we had to wait to get it out. And so, but basically, I selected all these places on their backdrop and the view on the Netherlands. And uh, for that reason, I could, could, could uh, show uh, d a different kind of landscapes, different kind of sites. Um, but the Dutch field is, is much more me exploring the whole subject than the later project, what I start in Europe later on. So I'm not even always on the ladder, I'm nearby, I'm not always standing, I, for instance here, I stand behind the goal. But you can clearly see that the whole theatrical approach, it's like what I, what I learned already when I was taking photographs on the street and didn't want to, what I, I, I wanted to emphasize of course is that uh, all what you can use is all these gestures from people and you pay attention to that and I took that with me when I um, was photographing football. The funny thing is when Martin Parr came to my house in somewhere in 2000, he told me, he had a kind of theory that was quite interesting. Uh, he, he was uh, um, coming to me to, um, to buy the set of prints of this book. And when I went to his house, I brought the prints and I was there with my wife, we had dinner. And then one moment he asked me, can you sign them all? So I sat down, I thought, okay, why not? <clears throat> and then Martin said, you're never going to make anything as good as this, are you? I said, okay, no, maybe not, but who knows? No, he said, I, he, he, he kind of felt that I misunderstood him. He said, no, 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 it's like this. I have a kind of theory that every photographer once in his life makes a kind of project that everything what he did before comes together in that project. And this is the, the kind of thing that, I, you can correct me if it's, wrong, but it's the kind of thing that is playing a role in the way he select at least these kind of projects that he want to buy. And well, I was coming from this kind of street photography, uh, like 10, 15 years later, you see me still working with a 6-9 camera. Some people think that I photographed this with a 4 by 5 inch, which is not true, it's a 6-9, it's a medium sized camera, which is actually a big Leica, which is a kind of continuing what I was doing on the street. Body language plays an important role, and so these kind of theatrical situations, uh, I, I, I liked to play with, and I still like to do that. Now here again, you can see that drama in amateur football never really becomes a drama, even when there is a broken leg, it has this kind of cheerful Saturday afternoon, let's go on, you know, let's wait till the ambulance is gone, and, and this is this is really true. I have a huge collection of these kind of portraits of these guys. I always ask them to stand after the game. And this, this is a funny thing, especially when you go in the countryside. From the 22 players, there is one or two you never can... They, they really attract your attention. It's just the way they are, you know. It's just the original way they move. And uh, I like to photograph these guys. It's not that they are good or bad players, you, 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 you wouldn't know that. <laughs> so then I'll move on to Belgium. This is around um, 2000 when we organized the tournament in 2000. I, I'm commissioned at that time to do a project. I did the Netherlands and then I move on to Belgium and I start also to film at that time. And the, here you can see, this is from, this is a step up from the, the European archive what I'm building up at that time and then as I start to film at that time you see in my archive you see these kind of situations and this is so funny about football they do it all over in Europe especially in the south of Europe and they come on the pitch and they just wave to the crowd but there is no crowd <laughs> but they do it everywhere I like this very much this is a kind of influence what television does with people yeah it's 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 uh, it makes sense in a way, but, but even when there are three people that you... So this is a, a little bit about how I, when I continue, how methodical my work became. Because I really had to 
do a lot of location search. For instance, I was invited by Martin in 2004 for the uh, rencontre in Arles, and he, in the winter, before the 2004 summer version of it, I photographed in the Provence, and during the week I would do a lot of research. Oh, I never go to a football ground which I haven't seen before, but people don't have to know that. It's just the way I work, because I don't want to be surprised. I want to know where the sun is. And then I come back in the weekend. This is, for instance, in uh, Opede, near in, in the Luberon, in the south of France. And I desperately wanted to have a wine field in the background of one of my pictures. It's the kind of same thing as what I told before. I would never photograph a wine field, but the wine field behind a football pitch. I do a lot of effort to get it behind a football ground. Um, so I'm, build, I'm building up my archive like that. When I do uh, an assignment like there, I need a typical French village in the backdrop. This is Lou Marin. This is the village where Albert Camus is, uh, was living during the last period of his life. Um, then I have an industrial backdrop and even the Mediterranean Sea. I would never take a picture of the sea, but I did a, quite an effort to get it coincidentally in the backdrop. Again, the same story, photography, photographing the sea leads to nothing for me. But to, to get it kind of nearby, as, as you kind of experience it in your life, it makes a lot more sense. Now, this is a little bit information about how I was collecting all this um, information, especially Eastern Europe. So uh, th this is also the reason why in 2004, this is in Italy, by the way, near Milan, but especially when I was in, in 2006, uh, I could publish a, a big book with a title, and I thought it was enough. Uh, it took me a lot of work to, uh, to do this, uh, but I still, every, especially every second year when there is this football tournament coming up, um, yeah, this is about looking the way in Portugal. I still have exhibitions with this project and it's still a traveling show. We, we usually have the videos, the landscapes, the portraits uh, in a museum. Um, this is in Portugal, same situation. This is not a gift from photography. This is the, the guy with the three legs, you see, in the foreground. I've never seen that. So industrial and then the sea on the other side. Um, I, I build up the archive like that. And then what I like, really like is uh, when I went to the UK in, uh, also it was in 2004, I was commissioned by the National Museum for Photography in Bradford. So I could do a project in Yorkshire. And there you can really see the original way sports evaluated in the countryside because they still have their playing fields where they play cricket, rugby. It's different from the culture where I come from. We, we have these kind of fenced football grounds where they have much more an open area in the city or in the landscape uh, where you can, you can kind of see. And also they have this beautiful, uh, on the lower level, or the way they organize football is so different from what I know from the Netherlands. I mean, we pay a kind of contribution and we expect everything to be ready. So these guys just meet up in the pub and they drive to the pitch and they, they do everything to prepare the pitch themselves. Now, looking at this, the phrase what I always used when I was uh, location searching, I would have somebody on the other line of the phone I said, well, I look at the situation as far as way as possible from the Champions League. Now, picture the Champions League and look at this. What a beautiful simplicity it is. What, what do you need to play a game of football? You, you need almost nothing. You need a kind of even, they even don't care about a flat area. They have quite slopey areas in, across the UK where they play football on. And they don't give about, they don't give a shit about a muddy pitch or, you know, all these things that in other countries they think, Ooh, we cannot play and, you know, they just do it. So I like it, I like very much that kind of approach. If you go to a little bit higher level, of course, the football looks different. Now there are, 
so this is again a situation where I would never photograph a stone wall landscape, but I did quite a lot of effort to get it in the backdrop. Um, this is a situation in Dublin where, where I was, uh, a lot of games were cancelled and I ended up in Phoenix Park and they have a lot of deer there. But I was quite lucky because they were far away and I was hoping that they would come nearby and in the end they did. I'm on a ladder again. Uh, so I cannot move, so I really have to wait till they come into my picture. This is also an island, and this is only a few photographs of what I find so, so in the way I select these football grounds is that if human being creates a facility for itself in the countryside, it, it for me a lot of, it makes a lot of difference than when, when uh, the municipal or uh, authorities uh, make a, a municipal football ground. This is so much more beautiful. This is in Sweden, they use probably dynamite to play a game of football. And then we have here in Portugal, uh, they don't have a flat situation, so they create a flat situation. And that, that was the way I was looking at this subject. Um, this is a film, the last thing I did in 2006 was a film for the museum in Cinisello in Milan. This is the beginning of that film. And again, it's, it's such a beautiful, simple approach. The people don't know it themselves because they just do what they do every weekend. But for me, it's, it's, it's a kind of statement about uh, probably they also have artificial grass now there. If I go back, probably it, it has changed. But it is so much opposite of what grew out of that sport with all this enormous, you know, the amount of um, money that is involved and so on. And, I, and, and it, 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 in the, in the, these films are only to be seen when I have an exhibition. I never show them on internet or whatever. Uh, I just keep it away from there. I, if, if people go to my exhibitions, uh, they can sit down somewhere in the corner and they can have a look at it. And there are, there are four or five films about half an hour and they have a similar building up. Now also here, they, it will happen in a minute, they just, they just go in and then come out running, look. This is so nice. <laughs> and this is basically what this is basically what photography and football have so much in common. It's it's their imagination that makes them play in a stadium. I mean, even when you score a goal it's not that we, we hear the wind through the pebbles. No, 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 we hear the crowd, you know? So this is, uh, this is what I like about football and photography. Then there, is, there are a few of these cultural differences all over the country. This, this is from the French, the same ground where I took the picture with the, with the Trini Sea. The French are very talkative, I can say, so they do a lot of, and they have these kind of disagreements every now and then. It's a kind of aggression, but it not, never comes into a fight. Um, but it, this can go on for like 15 minutes.
Then we have the Italians, I think. Yes, they are very good in gestures. I like it so much about the Italians that they... Also him, look. Then we have the we have oh this is another thing uh, <laughs> this is also in Italy same ground no but look look there is a there is a linesman he's he's very good look at him he's there and he is one of those former players and look at his legs his, you see <laughs> as well this will I do also. <laughs> And then we have the English. This, this is a little bit like Monty Python. If they chop up your arms and chop up your legs, they'll come on. So in England, you are a kind of wanker when you don't play on. He wants to play on, but he shouldn't. <laughs> it's crazy. You see? So, so this is. This is how we show it in, in uh, this is in a museum in, in Budapest. Uh, and this is a few pictures from my spin-off, commercial, commercial work. I did a big artist job uh, with all the stars. Doesn't happen very often, but it at least pays the rent for a while. Um, this is quite a nice project, what I did in Bhutan, Bhutan Montserrat, the other final. Um, that was in 2002. And anyway, in my archive, I have a huge collection of lonely goalkeepers. And this is obviously because half of the time I'm set up, I'm on the ladder, I'm standing there, this is my frame, I wait till the players come in, half of the time the game is on the other end. It's me left alone with the goalkeeper. And I never can resist taking their photographs. So I have a huge collection of photographs of, of them waiting there. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because it, I, did a, I, uh, I was commissioned by a Dutch film producer and uh, he said, yeah, I've been looking through the bookshops in the Netherlands, I'm looking for a photographer for a commission, I come to you. I said, why do you come to me? I said, because of your football pictures. What do you want me to do? I want you to go to the United States and photograph the landscape of the Western movie. I said, why that? He said, well, because there are two filmmakers and they made a film, it's called Go West, Young Man and we celebrate this year the 100th anniversary, year anniversary of the Western movie. I said, okay, I think about it, and I said, probably I will put something in it. So I went to the United States, I made a series of photographs of these places where they have been shooting uh, films, like Monument Valley, and when I went there, I thought, um, I thought I'd put a horse in it, and uh, the first pictures in my archive, there is just a horse. But um, I was there with my friend Julian Germain, he, he was my assistant at that job, and Julian and I said, the first thing we did, when, the first thing what well, happened when we were looking at the location, that the guy was asking me, do you want a black horse or, or a white horse? I said, well, can we bring them both? And then he was sitting on one of the two horses and the other one just took behind him and he was dressed up already like a cowboy. So then I thought it's quite an interesting thing to play a game with the, 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 the archetype of the cowboy and uh, in the end I, I made a series with a cowboy on the horse. But um, ultimately in, in a situation like this where uh, obviously this is kind of staged but they are real cowboys doesn't matter. So I was looking for, um, the, the cliche of America is of course that it's, it's an endless huge country, but as a photographer you don't have the possibility to show that. And it's in, in, if you drive through the countryside and you don't run into another 
vehicle in one hour, you really have to, wow, this is really huge, this is big, you know, this is America, finally we are there, you know. But I didn't want to make this kind of Route 66, rusted benzene station, gas, blah, blah. So I tried to avoid a a every reference in the picture of a size, like a building and so on. And what is interesting is, talking about me playing with foreground and background, this is kind of the ultimate situation. Because if I take away the horse, what is it? It's a landscape. But the moment you put the horse in, it becomes a backdrop, even when it's really far away. You know, this is kind of referring to all the cliches, all the cowboy films, they, they end with cowboy driving to the horizon. And, but I, I was really, uh, it was really a challenge to do something with an enormous, huge landscape country. So you try to get it as big and as empty as possible, but still you feel a little bit limited as a photographer. You have to, you have to translate a feeling somehow. But it made me think a lot uh, about uh, the, the nature of what you do when you use foreground and back. And this is, uh, when I went there, I had a, a chat with the, the two filmmakers, and they said that John Ford, who made the searches and these famous films, he used Monument Valley, never, it was literally in their script was that line that struck me also. He said he would use it never as a subject in his film. In all the John Ford films shot in Monument Valley, Monument Valley is just in the backdrop. So, and it, it's, it's true, you know, the beauty of Monument Valley is really present in the films of John Ford because he doesn't show it. He puts it somewhere behind other things. Um, and that's, these, these things are for me very interesting to, to think about it in that way. And then you see me again, I did a, another commission in the Netherlands about animals in the Dutch landscape. I use the same kind of body language in this situation, but for animals. Um, also to, to, to make a statement about the Netherlands, but in a different way. From that it leads to a book, a children's book that I published five years ago, it's called Counting Sheep. I was, m most of my work is just because somebody asked me to do something. This is, was a request, can you, can you make a children's book with photography? Now many of the children's books, they have narratives. So I said to them, okay, I start thinking about it, but that probably, I want to do probably with a very visual thing that should fit into my other work. And then you, when you start thinking about the book for children, and you think, whoa, it's not so easy, because most of the books are illustrations with a narrative. Uh, but I, am, I have a friend, he lives in the north, and he's a farmer. I met him like 12 years ago when he was photographing Dutch fields, he's in that book. Me and my wife, we do the farm whenever he's going on holiday. So two times, two times a year we are farming. And he leaves a little paper and he says, we have to count the sheep in the field. And as the Netherlands are a flat country, it's not so easy to count them because they, you know, they are positioned like this. So what you do is you kind of walk alongside and then you count them. And you see a little ear appearing behind the other. And so what happens is that we have to recount them every now and then. It's like, oh, it's, on the paper it says 38 and then we count uh, 37, oh, fuck, you know. Uh, 39, bloody hell. Uh, uh, 38, and then we suddenly go and have a coffee, which is obviously stupid. Now it was in winter that I was very cold and I took a couple of photographs and I said to my wife, well we can count them on the computer, not? We just, we just put it on the computer and then we count them. And these photographs I showed to the publisher and the publisher said, well that's a nice idea and this is how this book was done. Because then I said, okay, I will go back throughout half a year, every now and then I will photograph them and then we we made a book you see it's a wintry situation and then it's just called, it's just for children but it has already a third print run and it's it's a, it's it's a, it's a fantastic re, uh, success for the publisher it's very cheap it's 1250 it's a carton book uh, and this this is this is another situation where i'm asked for a newspaper to have on the back of the newspaper every month or no every week a sports picture and again I, I, I phone up these people and wherever they do in the Netherlands on the low level in sport 
I asked them, is there something visible from the Dutch, from the Dutch scenery around it? And then I really like to go there. Now this is, we are now in 2001, and basically what I said to these people from the newspaper, I said, look, there's a lot of sports in your, in your, in your newspaper, and it's a lot of top sport. Why don't we give a place in the newspaper to the readers of the, yeah, so w w why don't we show what they do? And, 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 and a newspaper is made by news people, journalists, and they are, not, they are not so willing to publish things in newspaper that are not news new related. Now, I call that always, the, what I call is, is the unhappy marriage between news and imagery. Because when you start thinking about when Martin Parr came to me and I started also thinking about that project in reverse, okay, because Martin said, I've never seen anything like this before. And now it makes sense in a way, because if a journalistic reason is the reason to go somewhere and take photographs, you wouldn't end up in kind of totally unimportant sports situation because it's not news related. So what we, looking back in reverse, what we document of our lives, of what was documented of our lives, was uh, many times was news related or some editorial uh, issue. And I, I always think, you know, this is only a part of life. You know, there is a lot of other things that are not news related, but they are definitely part of our collective memory of our life. And this is what we, uh, in documentary photography, of course, can, can do. So I kind of then build up this series and ending up with all kind of silly sports, which I didn't know they were happening in the weekend at all. Uh, but I, this is the way that, that uh, is so different from their way of thinking. They would publish a picture in a newspaper uh, um, only because of, of kind of event, for kind of, and, and I start to look in a very different way. What are people doing in the weekend? Where do they do, do, they do it and how does it look? So it's a kind of anthropology, it's a kind of sociologic reason. So you end up in a different way. This is just to illustrate the difference between their way of thinking and my way of thinking, because in the newspaper, if they would cover that sport, there would be a picture like this. And for me, it is obvious that you have to photograph also the scenery around it. Anyway, um, I come to, uh, towards uh, this project. Uh, in 2004, I was asked by a Dutch newspaper to drive around the countryside during the summer and it was the first time, time that I looked at my own culture in a way like, hmm, what am I looking at? So all these things that kind of raises a question. And I was, for instance, interested in why, is, why the hell is this there, you know, what is it? And then I would write about it. And then there is a situation where I end up in a typical Dutch square on a Sunday morning, it's empty, and I write a piece of column about this, and so this is so much how the Dutch, um, uh, we have a word for it, is a kind of design their environment. And it's always, you know, if, if, if it is kind of a reconstruction from places like this, and they literally have used a catalog where they have bins and they have benches and they have all, all the stuff that you need to rearrange. When you start thinking about a definition of our culture, um, it's a little bit like IKEA. It's a little bit like you have all these prefab elements which you see in different arrangements throughout the country. So when I was asked to do a project in 2008, at the beginning of this uh, book, there was a publisher that came to me and said, Hans, the Netherlands has changed so much over the last 30 years. I said, yes, 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 I know what you mean. There's a lot of new towns, a lot of new buildings. Uh, and I said, well, I, I don't want to photograph all this ugliness, but I do want to continue that I, something that I already started in 2004. And I went to this middle town, middle-sized towns in the Netherlands. And it, in the beginning of the book, I put this catalog, I show you a few images of all the street furniture and all the things that we literally can order. Um, when the opening, I was, I was lucky because the director of the Dutch 
Architecture Institute. He invited me with this um, exhibition, it was an exhibition uh, in the museum. And he said, okay, we have shown enough highlights from Dutch architecture, let's get rid of uh, Rem Colas and all the others. We will make place for this project. Finally, we show how the Netherlands really looks. And this is so much true because this is the dominant culture, not this. This is the dominant culture. And when the opening was in the museum, there was an, an audience of photography and architecture people. So I, I said to the architect, okay, I'm, I'm just a photographer, I'm a documentary photographer. I can only deal with contemporary things and the past. You, this is an art, artist impression, you guys, you deal with the future. You, you always create situations that are not existing yet, and you make plans about that. And so you see all these kind of things all the time. This is quite a horny one, to my opinion. Which, which they, they try to make it attractive for us, you know, that they are making this world, creating this world for us. They're really selling these kind of ideas to us in this way. So for me, it was obvious that I wanted to do something with these catalog images, but the reality looks like this. It's so far away from the artist impression. It's not only because it's, you know, it's a little bit more shabby than it used to be. Uh, it has a lot of reasons. So I ended up making, uh, I, I, I ended up using this kind of uh, element. I'm on a step ladder. I'm a little bit elevated. I use that strategy to emphasize that the way I want to look at the world and the way I want to present it is like looking at the theater, looking at elements that, um, that you can have a, a, a clear overview from a situation from a little bit elevated point of view as in a theatre play. And suddenly all these things that, that are in the picture, they, they, you kind of recognise from, from there. So you kind of recognise the whole idea of why a culture, how a culture is defined. Why immediately when we cross the border from Belgium or Germany, we sense that we are in the Netherlands. Now, this is not typical only for the Netherlands, because if you go in the UK or in France or in Germany, if you go to these smaller towns, it becomes more English or more German or more French, probably also in Italy. Uh, but in the Netherlands, we do it all in a different way. And so I, I documented this kind of situation and the, you, you kind of see here all the elements that come from there. So people literally order all these things. Funny thing also in the Netherlands is it's made of bricks. So the bricks that we build our houses of are the same, are coming from the same company. There's, they're in my book that the pavement is made of. Just because we are in a clay delta area um, and we, we use these kind of bricks. So um, there is in the book there is about 90 photographs and they literally show a kind of this is a kind of modern version we, we you can call it like like a 2.0 version of the Netherlands but there is a lot of a lot of things happening from the 60s 70s and the funny thing in this kind of um, um, situation is that uh, it's so recognizable for everybody, you know. Uh, it's so typical Dutch in a way, the way we deal with these things. Uh, and that was, that was my aim, to show how this mechanism works, why everybody starts to look more or less the same. Um, I think visually it's, uh, the funny thing is that you have all these, in the center of the city, you have, it's so much defined by our parents and so on already before us. So still you have a kind of mixture of uh, architecture. So anyway, these balls, for instance, you see everywhere. Uh, then you have the, it's not only yards, but also these kind of ING banks. They have a kind of certain architecture which you see everywhere. Now you have these, these kind of things. Uh, and also the trespa material. Um, you see, the, the, they are the same things in the catalog. And then you have the interior in where, where we drink a coffee. It's the same situation. It's everything becomes a concept. 
Now, this is an interesting development because in the old days, this is something, for instance, you can just order. They will make it for you in a week. You just say, I want a kind of early 20th century atmosphere. And, and the builders will come in and they will paint it. This you can all order from a catalog. Even the art, on the, and, and you can have the curtains and the lamps. Nothing here is original old. It's all a concept. So this is all about, it's not who you are, it's all about who you want to be. A similar thing happens in the towns. It's not about, as a small town, they also have this kind of uh, city marketing people, and they will tell the city, look, you really have to think about who you want to be. It's not about who you are. And then they, they, they start to have meetings, and they make it a little bit, in, they turn it into kind of democratic process, process and, and, and the public will be invited <laughs> And they can also think a little bit about where it should go. And then it ends up in a kind of Dutch compromise. Um, but it's all a conceptual way of dealing with things. Now, in, in these kind of places, this is a non-conceptual place. This is, th these are people, they were running this place for 30 years. And the only concept they had was a very simple one. You could eat there an omelette. And this you would see always there. Uh, mahi and pepper and salt. So nothing is here from a catalog. It's just a very simple strategy. Also the menu would be very simple. Now the, I, I, I went back there half a year later and these people retired and then you see the same, you see the same thing, you see? So this is a total makeover of the place. Same thing in the Netherlands, not only in the Netherlands probably, but it's the same thing, a different strategy, different concept, different, just the builders come in, they make a different kind of, in, like in a theater play. It's, it's the backdrop of our lives, constantly changing, same thing happening with, with uh, shops. Uh, and you can literally see these kind of, uh, uh, the elements coming back everywhere, because they just order it, and then they put it on the wall, you see. Also, these, these kind of things, you see them all over the place. Now, this is where it comes from. So, I started to investigate. Uh, this is, this is Bakarai Bart. It's a kind of franchise uh, bakery. We see it all over the country. So, they have this, this, this thing. It's coming back here, you see. So, when, once you start thinking about how your own culture is built up, uh, it, it, it really is defined by these kind of returning situations and, and elements. Now, to finish my talk, I started a magazine in, I think, 1999 with uh, Hans Aarsman, Erik Kessels, Julian Germain, and Claudie de Klein, and we called it useful photography. And useful photography is just a word to show things we have been collected throughout the years. Now, in Issue number two, published in 2001, for instance, we had a selection of photographs from eBay. eBay was at that time in America already quite a thing. It wasn't so in Europe, it was small at that time. So what we did, we selected from the internet during three weeks all the pictures that would appear next to the things people would like to sell. Now what we found so touching about it that people would have a problem, you know, they, they would use like white sheets, like a photographer does in the studio, but then they would do it in their houses. They, they, they were looking for white backdrops, uh, solutions like this, just to sell the things. It's, it's like a big flea market. Um, you see, this is a collection of the things in, in issue number two, all kinds of things for sale, which kind of it would be published, it was published like this. In the magazine. And then uh, I end with a story from useful photography number five. This is my friend, Jaap, I told you about him. He's the farmer. And as we are doing the farm, we run into uh, cow photography because whenever uh, a cow is, needs to be, uh, is fertile, we need semen, and the semen you order, and he had, uh, he called it a bull catalog. 
But what struck me was, of course, the way the cows were photographed all the time. So I went to find out, I, I, I uh, phoned up a cow photographer, and I didn't know that, but in the Netherlands there were about five, six cow photographers, professional cow photographers. And in, uh, in the world, uh, there were only 30. Um, it's all about breeding. It's all about recording what happens when, when a bull and a cow cross. And this is Lord Lily. Lord Lily, he had 150,000 children all over the world. <laughs> From the 60s, they started to freeze the semen. Semen is gold. It's the companies behind this, this, they are really making money. The children from Lord Lilly, they would be all over the world. In the old days, <coughs> if you would see a cow in the meadow, you would be sure that the, the father would be in the village somewhere nearby or another village, but not miles away. But the moment then, when they started to freeze the semen, they could, they could just fly it all over the world. So we, we published a selection of his daughters. These are all daughters from Lord Lilly. And if you look at this place, for instance, you can kind of see a returning spot, more or less, where you can see that, that the, the gene material is at least from, from half of the... Uh, this, is, this is an article about um, cosmetic uh, uh, manipulation of cow photography. Uh, but I, I went to a, a cow photographer and this film, what I show now, is him at work. And this is such a beautiful example of what most photography is. Most photography, what we see, is made on assignment. It really literally shows that reality is not very useful. A photographer needs a situation, he needs to create a situation, what he can use, what he can sell, what he's paid for. Now, the, a cow is not a very cooperative, cooperative animal. This film is three minutes, but it took him half, a, half an hour to make one picture. He is just giving telling people what to do. Put a little okay. grass there. Start by altitude. So the tail is pulled back with a kind of nylon wire. I remember I photographed in a ballet school in Russia in the 80s and the teachers would also do similar things to the children. They would just stretch them. Now, it's, it's all about bull sounds. He, he starts the sounds of, of, of a bull. And to get the ears up. You see the tail is going back with a little wire. Uh, this is the picture. Now think back about all the pictures in these magazines are all made like this. It's a fantastic idea, no? I love it. Anyway, this is so much what photography generally is. It has nothing to do with reality. It's a kind of reality people need. Yeah? People pay for and people can use. And that is the reason why there is a lot that is left, uh, kind of, I feel it like leftovers that I can use. Yeah, and because they don't need it. It's not useful, but it's sometimes very funny. Thank you so much.